This is Twit. Joining us right now uh, via Skype, I'm excited about this, see Alex Young. He is a PhD Associate Director for Science at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. I love your rubber chicken and Darth Vader head. Yeah, you, that's you, you got it all, <laughs> baby. That's nice. So tell us about, we, we wanted to get you on to talk about space weather. I know right now, I think we're at a 12-year low of sunspot activity. Is that right? Well, we're getting close to the low. So the sun has a cycle. We call it the solar activity cycle. It's, uh, it's about 11 years, sometimes a little bit shorter, about nine years, sometimes up to, to 12 years. And the peak of it was around 2013 or 2014. So we're now on the way down. Oh, we're okay. heading down towards the solar minimum. And that means there'll be less sunspots. This is where most of the activity comes from. Uh, you're showing a really nice picture. That that thing right there is probably about three, four times the size of the Earth. Wow. <laughs> and so, that's ejecting from the sun materials from the sun. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. So what that is is magnetic field coming up from below the surface of the sun. And that magnetic field gets all twisted up like a like a rubber band, basically. And you're seeing those those loops that you see are the magnetic fields, which are um, they're invisible, but the solar material traces them out oh, and allows us right. to see them. And these magnetic fields get all twisted up, and eventually, just like twisting a rubber band, you know, you twist it, twist it, eventually it's going to snap. It's got the energy's got to go somewhere. Well, the same thing is happening on the sun, and in that flash you see right there, that's what's called a solar flare, uh, which is releasing light across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, enough energy in that explosion to power the entire world for about 100,000 years. Whoa. Yeah. And thankfully, that energy isn't all, because the sun is, is circular and we're, we're orbiting around it, it's not always aimed at us, but occasionally exactly. it is. Exactly. Occasionally it is. And so this image you're seeing right here is showing you a lot of this stuff that comes off the material is magnetic. And so the particles are we are deflected around the Earth because the Earth is a giant bar magnet. It has its own magnetic field. But sometimes there's so much stuff that comes off the sun that it jostles our magnetic field and it creates these huge electrical currents in the upper atmosphere. And those currents can sometimes even be felt on the ground. Uh, and these are called geo, excuse me, geomagnetic storms. And in the worst case, the most severe storms can uh, create power outages. They can take down the power grids. I heard you mention uh, earlier the Quebec incident. Mm. In 1989, uh, the power grid and Hydro-Quebec power grid was taken down by a solar storm, and um, many millions of people lost power for quite a while. Wow. Yeah. Now, we also had, uh, back in the 18, 1859, I believe it this guy's was, an expert on the this Carrington stuff. event. Now, that was <laughs> exactly. a much, much larger solar storm and had much greater effects here on Earth, even though electronics wasn't even, I mean, it was borderline. We had the telegraph, and I think that was about it. So what was the exactly. Carrington event? So the Carrington event was observed by uh, an, ast an uh, English astronomer, Carrington, and also <laughs> another astronomer, Hodge Hodgson. So but we, we call it about the, him. the Carrington event. Um, so what he noticed was there was a, a white light solar flare. We actually, he actually was looking at the sun with a telescope and saw a flash of white light. And it turns out that's actually an incredibly rare thing. And that was the first time we had seen a solar flare. And because you could see it, it actually meant, we know today that that meant it was a huge, huge event. And what he realized is that was associated with a sunspot. And a couple of days later, he noticed that there were changes in, uh, in the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, we were still, we were actually measuring the magnetic field of the Earth, and these, these instruments measured it across, and it went off the scales. Um, and we saw aurora as far south as the equator. Wow. Uh, there are nice. stories of uh, cowboys in the West who woke up thinking it was dawn, but in fact, this was the aurora that was so bright. And as you mentioned, we didn't have the kind of technology we have today, but we had the telegraph. And so even when telegraphs were, un were disconnected from their batteries, they were still operating. Oh. <laughs> Some of them had enough current flowing through them that the paper tape registers caught on fire. Some of the telegraph Holy stations cow. burned down. Some of the telegraph operators were electrocuted. Um, so 
that is an indication of what could potentially happen if we had a huge power grid that would pick up those currents. So instead of having the telegraph pick up these currents flowing across the globe, you would have the power grids and even uh, pipelines, oil pipelines would pick up these kind of electrical currents. Now that storm was, uh, we think, something on the order of a thousand year, but potentially even like a ten thousand year event. So oh, that's that was good. huge. That was huge. So we don't expect another Carrington event. Well, I, I mean, uh, the impact yes. of that would be, I imagine, catastrophic. Well, yeah, well, uh, it could be uh, catastrophic. Now there's a lot of uh, research going on trying to understand this, but. It certainly would be in the billions of dollars, wow. the potential damage. Now, there are estimates. Some people agree with these, some people don't, that it could be up to trillions of dollars. Is there and anything you could do to protect yourself? Would Faraday shield? cages help? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what could you do well, if you well, knew this was going to happen? So we're, we're building uh, and, and modifying our electrical grids to handle this because there's two things that can happen. You have a surge, and that sets off a circuit breaker, basically. Right. Uh, that's the simpler, less uh, catastrophic uh, uh, event that could happen. And that can be uh, dealt with by maybe brownouts or even disconnecting par par parts of the power grid. But if you have a continual storm, and these things can last for several days, then what's happening is you're overloading this, these uh, transformers for a long period of time. And if they burn out, that's the worst possible scenario. That's, is that what happened in Quebec? Uh, that's what happened in Quebec. And actually, one of those transformers burned out in New Jersey because these power grids are connected to each right, other. Yeah, right. So, you, um, milk so there's some, you, could, you can actually uh, Google this and see pictures of this burnt out uh, transformer. And those giant transformers, the largest ones, cost millions of dollars. So power companies don't keep extra ones around because they cost a lot of money. And they take a long time to make. They take weeks to months to, to build. And I think there's only a couple of companies in the world that actually make them. Now, but you ask, what can you do? Well, you can, you can do things like uh, disconnect because the power companies monitor space weather just like scientists do. And if they see that there's a, a very strong potential of such storm, they would uh, take various, uh, I, I guess in some ways it's sort of like California. When, you, when you're, oh. Oh, did we just have an event? Oh. Uh huh. Oh, did I just blink? Yeah, you, you <laughs> froze. You're, hold on a sec. Am I back? I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's looking okay. good. Wi-Fi does blink that from time to time. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually connected to a hard line, but oh, uh, then I have no excuse. Uh, not yeah. as good as uh, as I would think. The yeah. sun um, is trying to shut you up. The sun <laughs> is trying to shut me up. Exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so if, if the the load on the system is too much, you can you can do uh, various types of mitigation to deal with that. You know, they're continually trying to improve the technology, improve capacitors and various aspects of the grids. So this is an ongoing effort. Um, and as we continue to better understand what's going to happen. Uh, but we also have the challenge that technology is still uh, developing around us. Um, and this was actually a fairly low solar cycle. So we are, uh, we're, we didn't experience all of the technology that we have uh, with a very, very active uh, space weather cycle. Sounds like we have a few years, uh, unless you, you occasionally have big uh, ejections in the, even in the off period. Well, that's, that's the interesting part is that these largest events that we've seen in history, some of them have tended to come on the downturn. Oh dear! <laughs> so right. any, it could happen. Any, so do and, and how much warning do you have? Do you see it start to happen? I mean, we see it, and you now the flare that that takes eight minutes. So by the time you see it, it's here. Right. But that effect is only on the side of the Earth facing the sun, and it's temporary. It does disrupt communications. Um, you can have these intense particle storms, which are dangerous for astronauts and satellites. But that geomagnetic storm comes from that big blob of material that comes off the sun. That takes uh, the fastest one, like the Carrington event, took about 17 hours. Um, a slower one, but still one that could have an impact may take a couple of days. So you do have some warning. Now, the, the unfortunate part is that we can see it coming, but we don't know the orientation of the magnetic field of that coronal mass ejection, we call it, coming off the sun. And we don't learn that 
until it gets to about a million miles from Earth, because we have uh, satellites called ACE and DISCOVER, which tell us the orientation of the magnetic field. Because the Earth's magnetic field at the front of the Earth is pointed upwards, and if the magnetic field of that coronal mass ejection is also pointed upwards, they kind of repel each other, and so the uh -huh. impact is not as much. But if the magnetic field of the CME is opposite, then it's they actually to... connect. So it's like having two magnets. If they're opposite, they repel each other. But if they're, I'm sorry, if they're the same, they repel each other. But if they're opposite, they stick together. And that's what happens uh, if the magnetic fields are, are oppositely oriented. And we don't know that uh, about until it's about a million miles away. And that gives us about 20, 30 minutes. Jeez. <laughs> Holy now that's, that, that's still a good enough time because they're paying attention to this. Right. They're monitoring it. But ultimately, we would like to have spacecraft that are farther away, right. uh, that are able to measure this stuff as it's coming by, sweeping past, and measure that magnetic field. It's not unheard of. In 2012, there was a pretty large event that missed yeah. us, right? Yeah. And for so some reason, event... NASA didn't say anything about this for a couple of years. <laughs> well, that event went off the side Okay, so we have spacecraft that are sitting uh, on either side of the sun. Actually, right now, they're behind the sun and they've crossed paths like this. But at that time, they were sitting on either side. And so we saw this, the uh, coronal mass ejection heading straight towards one of those spacecraft Oy. on the side. And we measured it, and it was somewhere in between the strength of what the uh, Quebec storm was and the Carrington event. So oh. it would have been oh. quite substantial if it, had, if it had gotten here. It reached that spacecraft, which is about the same distance uh, as the Earth to the sun, in about 17 hours. So it was incredibly fast, the fastest of these type of events that we have ever seen in the, in the space age. So uh, what kind of warning systems have you got to get to the power companies if something like this happens? How quickly can they pull those circuit breakers out and get us protected? Well, so the power companies work primarily. So NASA does mostly the research. Uh, NASA also monitors its own spacecraft and also works for the astronauts. But in terms of impact here on Earth, NOAA has the Space Weather Prediction Center in Colorado. They're part of the National Weather Service. They get data from their spacecraft and from our spacecraft, and you're showing right now one of their dashboards. This is the kind of information that the power companies are monitoring all the time, 24 hours, seven days a week. So they will see from the sun, from that, for example, that Lasco C3, that shows you the eruption coming off the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and using that, and, and other spacecraft that are looking at that view, that's called a coronagraph, which is kind of like an artificial eclipse. You block out the bright sun and allows you to see this stuff, these puffs of, of material coming off. They measure that material as it's coming off the sun. They can get the, the speed of it and then also get the direction and orientation. That particular one is looking straight from the Earth towards the sun. It's actually uh, looking at a point out in front of the Earth. And so when it comes towards us, it actually looks like a, a, a smoke ring heading towards us. They call that a halo event. Um, I'd call it a brown trouser in the, event. In the, <laughs> in, the, in the fastest ones, you will see snow on that image. You will see static because you see the particles, super high energy particles that actually get to the spacecraft and close to Earth very quickly. They're traveling close to the speed of light. So something like 10 to 15 minutes so you would see that before you even have this material get to us um and you you have these three parts you have the flash uh which is the solar flare which lights up the uh the side of the earth facing the sun you have the particles which are pushed by the solar flare and this material coming out it's like a snow plow scoops up stuff in front of it and then you have that slower piece the CME, and I say slow, it's still traveling several millions of miles an hour, but <laughs> the sun's a long way away. So it still takes a little time to get here. You know, those else, are sort of the three components of space weather. You know who else knows a lot about this is, is amateur radio operators. Hams mm -hmm. pay close attention to absolutely. that. Yeah, we, absolutely. We have a show on the network called Ham Nation every week. They have mm -hmm. a space weather forecast. I, I think Dr. T has, has uh, suspended her operations, but the, there'll be a new space weather uh, forecast from Tamitha Scove. 
I'm sure, coming on Ham Nation. Oh, Tamitha is great. Isn't she, she great? Uh, yeah. She's a colleague of mine, and uh, she does amazing, amazing videos. Yeah, yeah. Spaceweather.tv, they're kind of in a reconstruction phase right now. Excellent. But we rebroadcast those on our ham show because they, oh, hams want to know this stuff, right? Oh, it's that. so the, the hams, ham radio operators really know their stuff, and they have a yeah. great network. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad we could talk to you. So I, I guess, uh, Alex, uh, there's, it's good to know this. Mm. People who are responsible are working hard on it. Nothing I should do. Should I get a foil umbrella? Is there anything? <laughs> should no, I? The, the the good thing is, uh, you know, I think it's uh, it's important if you're interested. You've got a lot of great resources at NOAA and NASA to to keep an eye on what's going on because of the technology we have today. All of this data is available to everyone, and so I think that's one of the amazing things that we have at our fingertips now. So what I hope is people will be aware. Keep an eye on it. There's a, a site from a colleague of mine, solarmonitor.org, which is great. And then another one called helioviewer.org, which allows you to go in, make your own videos, your own images. You can zoom in, see what's happening. Uh, you can overlay different data sets. And then all that stuff is uh, put up on YouTube also. Um, so there's just a lot of great resources. Uh, NASA and NOAA are constantly keeping everybody a bit up to date. The good thing is that we don't have anything to worry about in terms of our own health here on the ground because we have a very thick atmosphere which protects us and a strong magnetic field which protects us. Um, but the technology that you and I depend on is susceptible to this. And so the good thing is that we've got all these scientists and engineers around the world that are monitoring this uh, to make sure that uh, we can continue to use our tools and our toys and not have to worry about it. I mean, given the early warning systems that we've got, would there ever be a would something, say, like the, the current event, be stopped by that, or would actually overload the systems even with the circuit breakers in place? I think even with the, the preparations, there would be some damage. I mean, there, there, I don't know, unless they were to just turn everything off, and I don't see, that seems like an impossibility mm. to turn off all the power across the... Because this like, is a global event, and it can last for a couple of days. It's like an EMP, right? I mean... The, which would well, be it's, it's similar. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it is it's not in this case, it's not electromagnetic pulse, which is actually kind of what the solar flare is. But that's stopped by our atmosphere. OK, but it is um, electrical currents because, you know, the Earth is a big magnetic field. And when you take a magnetic field and you jostle it, right, the same. Mm -hmm. the that's same how you generate electricity. electricity. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly how you generate electricity. So yeah. that's what's happening up great. in the upper atmosphere. <laughs> oh, but great. long conducting uh Things like power lines and uh, and pipelines pick those currents up on the ground, and that's where the problem uh, I lies. See. So if you have a laptop, unplug it. Would that be sufficient? I guess. Yeah. I mean, or well, should you put yeah, it in the I basement? Mean, really <laughs> <laughs> or in a Faraday well, cage in the basement? The good thing. <laughs> the good thing is that those high energy particles. If you had something high up, let's say, uh, you know, up in space, or even at a you know a higher altitude, higher than we usually go they can be uh, affected. But for us here on the ground, those particles will not generally oh, cause good. a problem oh, with our, our okay. Now, but cosmic rays, we still have to deal with those. The sun <laughs> actually pushes cosmic rays away. Yeah. Uh, so when the sun is not active, we then have to deal with these cosmic rays coming from the galaxy. Oh, great. I know. And if I you're know. a telegraph it's operator, thing, it's another. get the hell out of town. <laughs> It's great to talk to you. See, Alex Young is a PhD Associate Director for Science at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and a space weather forecaster, I Indeed. guess. A weatherman. I love it. A weatherman for humanity. Alex, I'm so <laughs> glad we could talk. This is fascinating stuff. We'll Thank stay you in touch. Sure, uh, you guys uh, should come visit. I would love to. Yeah, we'll bring really. a camera crew. That'd be really fun. We'd Have love to do that. Anytime. Yeah. And we'll talk to you after the next CME. Maybe we'll be, maybe or maybe not. Maybe we'll uh, be yeah, able to. I, I myself maybe, will be sort of getting be, up in Mad I'll be Max on the phone. <laughs> well, next time I'm out there, I'd love to come visit you guys. Please do. Please. You're always welcome.